Hi, everybody. Good morning. My name is Ayende Alakoye, and I'm the founder and, uh, and CEO of Needle. Um, and uh, I'll give you uh, a little bit of an introduction of myself, but today we're going to be talking about persisting and moving forward. Um, and uh, as startup founders, investors, uh, professionals of all um, of, of, of all backgrounds, um, persistence has been the thing that has made me stand out um, as an entrepreneur. Um, I'm a three-time founder, and uh, and it's been the the biggest aid to me. Um, my name Allende is uh, is I, I like to say it is an American name, uh, just like John or Jack, um, but its heritage is rooted in in Nigeria. My family wanted to reconnect us to our heritage before the Great Interruption, and so um, so that's how my sister and I were named when we were born. I'm from DC originally, moved to Los Angeles in uh, almost 21 years ago exactly, and, uh, and started, um, started off in radio back, in, back on the East Coast. And um, I am the, the creator of the original iHeartRadio app and had the chance of a lifetime to write for President Obama back in 2008 as well. Um, but I'm going to share with you three stories with you today. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my my college years and how it laid the foundation for for uh, for the tenacious qualities that I have in terms of uh, holding on to to uh, to goals. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the start of my career uh, in sales. Then I'm going to pause a little bit for um, some Q and A so that we can make it interactive. I'm not just talking to you the whole time. And then, uh, and then I'm gonna tell you a little bit about um, the most recent chapter for me um, and, and what we're doing with Needle uh, and, and how we're bringing the same qualities um, to what we're doing today and how it's helping. I'll, I'll, give you the whole, I'll give you the whole story of how we started with you know, zero dollars and zero cents to raising a million dollars and beyond uh, of venture capital. So, um, so let's advance the slide and, and go to laying the foundation. And for me, the foundation of tenacity uh, in the previous slide um, was, uh, is, was, was really set in college. So again, I'm from Washington, DC, and I'm old enough that when I was from DC, it was called Chocolate City. Um, but I went, ended, up going to, um, ended up going to college in Pennsylvania. Uh, and, it was an, uh, basically all European American school. Only uh, a thousand kids, but only 10 of them were African American. And so um, one of the things that I say is that tenacity cannot be taught, it has to be learned. And before college, I really didn't have any reason to hold on to anything uh, for that period of time. But I learned that tenacity in college. Uh, I was going to go to Morgan State University and HBCU, but the last minute I got an opportunity to um, to to play um, Division One volleyball at Juniata College, and I jumped at the opportunity. So, um, so four years at an an all European American school, it tested every aspect of my of my fortitude. It tested my ability to be uh, in an environment that was completely, um, I wouldn't say unfamiliar because I'd grown up around uh, white kids, so to speak, but it was very uncomfortable, right? So it was uncomfortable uh, and, uh, and there were many challenges. Any, cha any, any kid going through college goes through challenges um, and those challenges were exacerbated by the times as well because you know, I was in school during the Rodney King riots um, uh, and uh, and, and all of those things were happening while I was sort of in this really fixed, very homogenous environment. So, um, so it was very challenging, but out of that experience, I knew that there was nothing that anybody could ever say to me that, um, that I could not do. Because I knew that if I could get through four years at Juniata, which it wasn't like a, um, 
an internment camp or anything like that, but it was very challenging. If I could get through four years there, I could do anything. And um, so let's advance the slide to the next one, where, um, where um, when I graduated from, from college, uh, Joanna, are you still there? We're gonna advance the slide one. When I, thank you so much. Okay, so when, we, when, I, it, when I graduated from college uh, with an African sounding name, it didn't open very many doors despite having a four year degree from a good private school. And uh, I ended up at an entry level position to uh, in a customer service call center. Um, I quickly worked my way up to supervisor. Then I got promoted to uh, an internal RFP uh, sales team. Uh, but I really, really wanted to be in sales. I started off again in the customer service department. And I remember one day sitting there in, in, my, in my cubicle with my, uh, with my headset on listening to a customer. And we, we were on the first floor and there was steps to go to, to, the, um, to the parking lot outside. And I remember seeing the, the headlights of this beautiful black Jeep in 1996 uh, and, and out from the Jeep comes this uh, good looking African-American man. This black man walks through the call center and he's just like, he has all this, just he's just got this magic about him, right? He walks all the way through and he walks over to uh, to this beautiful woman who who's on our floor, gives her a kiss, and that's his girlfriend. And I'm like, who is that guy? I want to be like that guy. And uh, that guy was a person in the sales department. And I was like, okay, I want to do sales. And it was at that moment that I decided that that's what I wanted to do. And uh, even though I kept getting promoted, there was some resistance to putting me in the sales department. So. I finally, out of frustration, made an appointment with the CEO of the company and walked into his office and and sort of timidly, um, but with with uh, some some veiled, uh, some veiled timid timidness, I was confident and I asked him, I said, um, I want to be in the sales department. And he's, he looked at me, he said, any person who makes an appointment with the CEO to be in the sales department is already a salesperson. So he put me there. So I was installed as a salesperson, even though I had already interviewed there and was denied an opportunity to, to work there. So I spent the next 11 months working with the manager who had to, uh, who was told by uh, her manager to hire me despite the fact that she had already said no. So that was, as you can imagine, a very tumultuous experience. And even though I made my budget every single month, um, it, it, uh, I, I refused to, 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 to sort of back down to um, the supervisor who did not like me in the role and made it very, very difficult for me to stay there. Um, and, um, and it taught me a super important lesson. The lesson was not don't over go over somebody's head, but the lesson was actually that sometimes letting go of the things that you're, you're persisting with is is actually the way to create even more uh, opportunities and better results for you. And here's why. I finally uh, decided that it just wasn't worth it for me to continue because I was starting to experience, um, a certain experience um, sort of health issues. And just, I was, I was like in my early twenties and I was getting hypertension. So, um, and this is before people were openly talking about anxiety and so forth. So, um, so I, I, I learned um, that, that I really just needed to let it go. And when I did, it opened up an opportunity to start in the radio advertising sales, which was, is, is the foundation of my career. And I earned four times as much the very next year as I was in the previous position. Um, and so there are three reasons why you should let things go. Number one, I listed there is health, right? Obviously, if things are getting in the way of your health, you need to let things go. The second thing that um, is if you stop learning, right? So I was in the position for 11 months. I had learned a great deal about uh, what it took to, to do that job. I had mastered that 
that job and where we were. Um, I'd made my budget every single month, uh, despite um, difficult situation. And um, at that point, I was no longer learning. At that point, I was now just trying to be there to, to, uh, to prove something to myself about a certain person, right? So I will never forget her name. Her name was Kelly. She was my supervisor. And, and at that point, I was there really because of whatever um, feelings or emotion I had tied up with Kelly. And it had no longer anything to do with the purpose, the original purpose of being there. And so uh, there's such a thing called a money trap, a monkey trap. Hey, from I see Peter from, um, from Barbados. Does, does anybody here know what a monkey trap is? If, if you're if you if you're here and you know what a monkey trap is, just uh, okay. So I see. Please explain. All right. So a monkey trap is, and I've got a little picture there. It's it's a way that um, that people in Asia, people in Africa, people in India, they trap monkeys. They set a bait with uh, with a uh, either a coconut or some kind of fruit that's big enough for uh, for them to carve out a space for a monkey to slip uh, his hand, his or her hand through. And they put food in it to trap the monkey. And what happens is the monkey will, <laughs> well, uh, the monkeys aren't too smart, he says. Well, the monkey will slip uh, its hand in there, grab the, the food and try to pull his or her hand out. And what happens is the monkey's hand gets caught by its fist. So the very thing, um, so tenacity means grip. So the very thing that is a, um, a positive thing and necessary for your success can also stop you from having greater success. Because once the monkey is in there with its fist, then the, then the, uh, then the hunter comes and kills the monkey because it won't let go of the food. Uh, and so he could have his freedom if he just let go, but it won't let go. So that's a monkey trap. And that's what I was in. I was holding on so tight to that to that sales job that I couldn't see anything else. And once I let it go, all these other things became possible. Let's advance, please. Thank you. So let's talk about needle and and let's talk about you know where we are today. And I'll and I'll tell you uh, how we got there. So today, needle um, my company gives everybody their own live call-in radio show that transcribes, monetizes, and amplifies the words as they speak. Um, so uh, so you can listen to, to Needle, it, 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 please advance. Um, you can listen to, to Needle, uh, thank you, uh, even without having the, um, the app. So, uh, so if you're a, a broadcaster, you can go on and you can share it with everybody in the, in the world and they don't have to have the app to listen to you. Um, you can also make hay, which is currency on our platform. For every one hay you you uh, you get, it's one dollar that you can cash out. So it's a very, very, um, it's a very easy. It's very easy to monetize on our platform, and you can advance, please. Uh, and we've even gotten some amazing uh, team with Peter Norvig and Kevin Mayer from. Uh, so Peter Norvig, who is the head of research at, at Google, and Kevin Mayer, who was previously. Uh, in line for CEO at uh, Disney and, and then became CEO at, at TikTok. Um, and then please advance to, uh, to Fat Joe, who's gonna be going uh, on air today for the first time, which we're super excited about. Um, uh, and you can advance one more, please, too. Uh, and then actually tomorrow, I'm actually playing hooky to be with you today. I should be uh, wrapping up our 10 week uh, experience at Google where we're one of just um, 11 other companies that were chosen for the inaugural Voice AI Accelerator. Uh, and uh, we have demo day tomorrow. Uh, so, so we've got like amazing things happening with our company, but it wasn't always like this. Uh, next slide, please. In fact, we started off very differently than where, where we are today. Um, our beginnings were super, super humble. Uh, we, we started off at a pre-accelerator. And um, and I say that because um, one of the things that I did 
before starting this 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 uh, business was one of the best things I ever did. I read uh, a book called Ego is the Enemy by Ryan Holiday, and I recommend it to everyone, especially those who think that they don't need to read it. Uh, <laughs> because what you'll find from that book is that ego finds its way into your life, no matter how uh, how much you meditate, no matter how much you go to church, no matter how much you 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 uh, aspire to be a humble person, ego has ways of integrating into your life in ways that you don't know. So here I am, a um, a three-time founder. I've raised millions of dollars uh, at this point, and we were we we had this idea to start this company inspired by President Obama and to democratize access to information and the microphone itself. And it's this huge thing. And we're not able to attract any traction so far, even though we had Ken Hertz um, uh, that you saw on one of the previous slides was our first investor. And he is, uh, is Will Smith's attorney um, and the entire Smith family's attorney. And he put money in the first day he heard about it. We weren't able to get much further than that. So, I had an opportunity to go to this pre-cellerator. And this pre-cellerator was like, literally we had to pay to get in. They've changed the structure since then, but we had to pay to get in. But it gave us um, some opportunity for office space. It was basically like an incubator that we had to pay for. Um, and and um, But I did it because I knew that we needed um, an opportunity to build the company and to get exposure. And what I found out was that putting ourselves in a position, despite having a founder who created the first iHeartRadio and all the other stuff that you'd be like, oh, wow, this is a great company. Putting ourselves in a position where we were sort of the big fish in a small pond made all the difference in the world for us to, um, to stand down. And, and that's not a diss or anything to the other amazing companies and founders that were in that space, um, a lot of those people uh, who uh, I'm still friends with today and have great relationships with, uh, lifelong relationships with, um, they were first time founders. But, but because African Americans are typically um, over coached and underfunded, um, rather than fight that, I sort of just kind of went with it. And because I went with it, we were just able to stand out. We got investment out of that space. Uh, we were able to, get an, able to get an MVP out of that space. And eventually we raised our first million dollars, not out of that space, but actually from a lead that came from that space. We joined an accelerator. And then from that accelerator in San Francisco, we moved back down here uh, to LA and we were able to raise our first uh, million dollars. So this was really, honestly, the first company in 13 years that I ever raised venture capital um, for. And it took us 18 months to raise our seed round, um, but we were able to, to, to raise it. Uh, I'm gonna pause there for some questions um, just to see if anybody has any questions before I continue on this slide. And, um, and I'll, I'll see if, uh, if anybody put some, some, some uh, some questions in in the uh, in the chat because I want to make sure that we're tracking and then you guys are if, if, that I'm making sense. Uh, how about this? Am I making sense? Put a one in the chat. Okay, fantastic. Okay, all right, cool. Um, so so let me continue with this slide because I think it's uh, super important. So there's there's um, and and I'll recap at the end of the slide. Thank you. So what were the reasons investors passed on you early on? Uh, I would assume that it means early on. Um, we, uh, we were launching in 2000. And, it, and so what I'm trying to give you is some context. So we launched in 2017. We were to be the, the search engine for all of live broadcasts, our, our value prop at the time was that, um, that radio wasn't searchable and it wasn't really accessible and it wasn't really modernized with our tech, with 
current technology. And so what we said was that we're bringing all the radio stations on the planet together so that you could search them by anything uh, spoken or sung in real time, and then add your own voice to the live broadcast um, and be searchable as well. So we were pioneer pioneering um, live uh, user-generated audio, uh, creating your own live broadcast. So if you're familiar with Clubhouse, we were pioneering that back in 2017 and allowing you to be searchable along with KCRW and NPR and ESPN and all those other things in real time. And people were saying that we didn't have revenue. And we were saying, well, we needed scale to get revenue. Uh, so that so that was that was really um, the first thing. And so we immediately um, decided to focus in on one. And one of the things I, I, I tell startups all the time who ask me advice, I say, if you can make your first thousand dollars, then you have a real business. And so we made our first two thousand dollars by selling the transcriptions, the live transcriptions that we were doing on live audio, uh, which we, by the way, have a, a patent on now. Um, we sold those to to um, to to marketers, to uh, to advertisers, and to get our first two thousand dollars in the door. So, at that point, we started to be able to raise capital after we after we proved that we could um, generate revenue. I'm going to come back to the questions uh, after uh, this slide, and thank you for that that question, Arnold. So, the next thing that we did was we we raised a million dollars. Um, so this was a huge, uh, an amazing opportunity. I was, um, I was, you know, very, very proud. I mean, uh, I tried to do a calculation of how many African American men, and I think that's something that's not talked about enough. I, I'm dark skin. I'm six four, and if you're afraid of black men in the street, if you're a cop, then why wouldn't you, as a, as a Average size um, VC have some prejudice about that, right? So, so I feel very proud and very excited. And by the way, the investor is a six-four uh, guy <laughs> like me. Maybe it makes a difference, but um, I feel very proud and excited that um, that that we were able to raise a um, uh, million dollars. Uh, I think I'm only one of 250 African American men who have ever raised over a million dollars or currently uh, active companies. Um, uh, of VC capital, and I expected that I was going to be a made man, right? Like you've heard the the mafia thing when you're a made man, then things get a little bit easier. I expected doors to open, but no doors opened as a result of us raising a million dollars. I thought that the vetting, uh, the vetting process to get that million dollars would allow would carry over, and it did not. And so I'm here to tell you that when it, it, I'm here to validate those of you who have raised over a million dollars, you know this already, and I'm here to tell you if you haven't yet done that, that you have to keep working as if you've raised half of the round. So um, we, we were you know, very diligent. We didn't let down our work effort at all. We kept raising capital because they say to raise capital when you, when you, don't, uh, when you don't need it. And we kept working to raise capital, but we weren't able to, to raise additional capital. And, um, and to do that again, I, I would operate differently. I would operate as if we only raised a half a, half a million dollars and, and, uh, and work you know, 20 times as hard as if we'd only you know, raised a half a million dollars to continue to, to, to raise capital because, um, because things didn't, open the way that I thought that they, they could or should. And, um, and finally, the, 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 less, the lesson that we've learned the most is, um, is that uh, it's not over until the fat lady sings. But everybody says that, but they don't tell you that you're the fat lady, right? And so um, at the, at the in, in, in pretty much the end of 2019, we had almost exa exhausted all of our funds. And I had been talking to and giving updates to all of our investors all, all along the way and, and sort of sounding the, 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 uh, the alarms as they got closer to, to, uh, to running out of capital. 
And I literally had one investor who I will not name uh, say to us um, when I told them that we were out of money, they took it as that we were done with the business, that the business was over and said to, said to me, it happens to the best of us, which I was literally floored and shocked that they said that to me because I, I thought of all the people who would be interested in us fighting on and moving forward and, and just and, you know pushing uh, and persisting, uh, I thought it would be our investor who had a monetary stake in us. And it didn't seem to be that, that, that way. And I didn't take, I, they were thinking that we were done I knew that we weren't, and and it was at that moment that I realized that you know no matter what, um, it's up to you to decide when it's over, and it wasn't over for us. So we kept pushing, and we came back from that. We ended up raising a small round. We kept building, and eventually we managed to get into the Voice AI Accelerator, uh, which completely breathed new life into our company. And today we're prepped to announce tomorrow at Demo Day. Uh, you're getting early, an early announcement, but a 3.25 million dollar round that we're that we're going to be closing in the next couple of uh, weeks, uh, if not um, uh, months, and one third of it is going to be uh, on Republic, so that people can participate with us. But um, but yeah, so the three lessons, just to to recap, are you know undersell yourself, go into places where you can be the big fish. Um, don't don't buy into the uh, made man myth, which which it depends on where your what your background is, but it's not the made man myth is for Italian mafia. It's not for necessarily me or or you. And then you're the fat lady when it comes to deciding when it's over. And you can advance the the slide, please. And then I'm going to open it up for questions. Uh, if you want to contact uh, us, please reach out. And, uh, and say, hey, thank you so much for listening. And I'm looking forward to, uh, to some great Q&A here. I see lots of congrats. I appreciate you all, thank you. Uh, still lots of work to do. Remember, we're gonna operate like we've, like we've uh, only raised half of it. Okay, so uh, Peter Bancroft says, how do you advise a company not in the USA to raise funds? Peter, can you give a little bit more background? Where are you and what industry you're in? And then we'll come back to your question. Uh, and then Arnold says, right in those 18 months of fundraise. Yes, uh, yes, I answered that question. And you're in Barbados, Peter. You have a global product. <laughs> um, all right, so I, I, I honestly, do not know what it's like to live in a in a in another country, let alone to raise capital in another country. Um, but I will give you a couple of resources. One of the resources actually meant to to list it on this page is, and I'll I'll put it in here. Uh, I'll put the title at least in here. Uh, how to start a startup is one of the best uh, one of the best resources that I I can give to people. I watched How to Start a Startup, which is basically um, Sam Altman and Y Combinator's free YouTube service. Anybody in the world can look at it. Um, but the thing about it is that unless you've experienced it, you don't know how real it is. And so I looked at it after two uh, two companies, two startups, um, and and I saw all the mistakes that I'd ever made uh, represented in, in those. And uh, I can tell you that if you do wrote what they say, then you'll you can have this kind of success that we've had with Needle. Um, so I, so hopefully that helps you, uh, Peter. Also with equity investment, uh, thank you, Eric. I appreciate your nice comments. Uh, also with equity investment, what percentage of your company were you prepared to give up? There's some great um, articles on Quora regarding. Uh, what percentage of your company you should give up? Uh, if I'm right, you should expect around 20, 15 to 20% per, per round. But check it with Cora because every company is going to be different depending on uh, the experience of the founders and, 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 the, and the industry that you're in. Um, so so that's, that's something to think about. 
And then how complete or far along, thank you, um, Patria. Wow, we have an amazing, hey, Amy. Um, how complete or far along was your product at the time of initiating meetings with VCs? Well, we kind of thought that we would be able to, to do what we see happening in, uh, in uh, Silicon Valley all the time, <laughs> which is great idea, great founder, initiate contact with VCs, raise $100 million, done deal. So that didn't quite work for us, but, uh, but we were able to, um, to, to add some, some metrics to those. Uh, so we had a, so we had a, a, a an MVP. Uh, we had uh, on, on Alexa, by the way, so you could, so everybody's MVP is going to be different. Our MVP was you could search 120,000 radio stations by live news, sports, talk, information, and music on Alexa. And we were initiating conversations with uh, VCs, and we were able to raise our first 25K from Arlen Hamilton and Backstage Capital uh, at that time. Uh, uh, still, um, I, I think, you know, behind the curve. But look, if, if you know that you're an African-American or, uh, or a woman founder, you know that you're going to need to work 10 times harder, period. So... You just uh, so so that questions. It's a variable. It depends how uh, on your market and depends on which VCs that you go to. So I would uh, I would you know aim to to adjust those those metrics. Typically, you're going to need to have some traction, but it's going to be different for every uh, company. Revenue absolutely helps, and then um, and then you know a proven little audience that uh, loves your product. Uh, thanks, Joanna, for putting all those links there. So how complete a far along? We read that one. Tanya says, thanks so much for helpful and inspiring. God bless you. I hope so. I'm located in Barbados. She told me this. And then Kelly says, hi, is there a way that we can watch the demo day pitches tomorrow? Okay. And then let's see if there's any other questions. All right. I think that those are all the questions. Does anybody have any, any last questions for me? We'll take, like, let's say one more question. Let's say one or two more questions. Thank you, Kal Kalia. Did I say that correctly? Kalia Clerkley. Callie, nice. My, uh, I have a handle. Caliende, yeah, so it's Cali with the, anyway, Cali, nice to meet you. Uh, all right, so I'm going to say thank you all, and um, and uh, I really appreciate you, you spending time with me today, and look forward to hearing you on Needle. Have a great day. <laughs>